So I was going to talk about it a little bit, so for him to sit there and be quiet, because that's hard for him to do. Uh, most of you, if you've been to church around here, you're regular here, you see this little fella. He's not a little fella anymore, a lot. But uh, he's special to me. As you know, most of you know, uh, that has been in this church a while. Ellen and I grew up here together from the time we were little things. I've uh, been best friends. I had all three of her kids at one time or another in uh, child care. This one, from the time he was a baby, I had him in the toddler room. The one sitting with her over there, I had him the time she was six weeks. He's my baby. And I, I've always, I, since I didn't get married and have kids and have grandkids, I've always shared Ellen's. They all call me Aunt Tammy. Her, all, all her kids call me Aunt Tammy. Her grandkids call me Mima. So I told her she had to share hers with me since I didn't have any of my own. And she's been gracious enough to do that, and I appreciate that. And I had her grandchildren. But this one right here, he's special. And I give him a hard time, but he is very special to me. Tuesday night, he came to my house to practice. He's been wanting to sing for a while, and especially this song, because the song is perfect about for his situation. And he kept telling me he wanted to sing it on his 10th anniversary. We don't want to do it last Sunday, but I said, wait till this Sunday, because I think it's perfect for St. Jude Kingdom last Sunday. But um, at, we, they were at my house Tuesday night. Ellen said, do you remember 10 years ago today? And boy, do I remember that day. January the 15th, 2003. I was at work. I don't remember much of the morning, but I know after lunch, I'd been helping with lunch, and I went to my office. My assistant was with me, and uh, the, the minister of education at the church, Robbie Smith, who was another one of my kids that grew up and worked for me a while, but he was minister of education. They were in my office, and I got a phone call, and I picked it up, and it was Ellen, and she was crying. And I knew something was wrong when Ellen was crying. She was really upset. And she said, Ross just had a wreck. I said, we're at the hospital, and it don't look good. And I said, well, I'm on my way. I hung up the phone. I told Robbie and Beth, I said, go on. We'll take care of everything right here. Just go on, because we all knew and loved Ross. I took off to the hospital, got there. I knew it was bad, and I walked in, and Audrey, her oldest daughter, was in the emergency room with the, uh, some of the administrative staff from District 5. Ross and two other boys were on their way from West Side to the uh, Extension Campus for class. They were in a little hurry. They were young 16-year-old boys. They were going fast. Another guy from our church was driving. Another guy was in the back. Ross was in the front. He didn't have on his seatbelt, but I think he's learned his lesson there. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, Ross was got the worst end of the deal. He was thrown out of the car, landed in our yard, had severe head injuries. Audrey took me to the room where her mom and her dad and some other family members were. And they come in and told us they were that he had some other injuries, but they were more concerned with the brain injury. It was very serious. They were moving into neurointensive care, so we followed them up there. We went to neurointensive care and they took him back. Within a few hours when school was out and the church heard the place was packed. The halls were full, the waiting room was full, people were everywhere, because they loved this little guy right here. And uh, sometime that afternoon, I don't remember exactly when, that was all a blur a little bit, but I remember, I think it was the pastor, came, Steve Silvey came up there right away, and uh, he was there, until it was, and it just so happened, God, nothing takes God by surprise, it so happened it was on a Wednesday. And... Uh, so we were there, and I was the candidate for the church, but I told the pastor, I said, I'm not going to church, and I'm staying here with Ellen and them. He said, okay. So he left to go to church. And I think this happened, I'm not sure, but I think the doctor come out and talked to Ellen and them before church, around 5, 6 o'clock, something. The doctor, I was standing right beside Ellen when the doctor came out and looked at Ellen and Bobby. And, and this is probably, I know it's hard for her. It's hard for me, but I, can, I cannot imagine being in her shoes. said, he, will not, he won't make it through the night. His brain swelling at a rate that he won't he won't be here in the morning. Yeah, well, we don't get to that part. <laughs> we know you still we know you still here, honey. <laughs> but word got around, and it was before social media, but the internet was still out there. Word got around, and people were praying all over the country and all over all over Anderson. But they said it. Said, I was not a covenant that night. But they said a covenant that night. They had prayer meeting. We call it prayer meeting. But they had prayer meeting. They said as soon as they opened the service, people were in the altar on their face praying for him. And they said there was crying and there was a lot of, there was prayers going up. And they said they really had a prayer meeting for this young man. And I tell you what, we waited through the night. I stayed with Ellen all night long. 
pastor was there most of the night. I, th I think his cousin, his uncle Keith, and a few other people were there. We finally made Ellen lay down over in a corner and go to sleep a little bit. She was exhausted, but we waited all night. We was waiting for that word for that doctor to come say he's gone. But morning came. Then came the morning. I love that song, but that was, oh, I remember that. Then came the morning. We had no word. He was still there. Weeks later, he was still there. We'd go in and talk to him. I remember I tried to go by every day, and we'd go in and talk. That's probably why he loves me so much, because he heard his own voice. This is a big mouth lot. And I, he could hear us, but he was in a coma. And through months and months, he's still here. Ten years later, he's still here. He's come a long way. I remember the first, uh, when he got out of the hospital from Atlanta, on his 17th birthday, I said, we've got to give this boy a party. So we had a big party over at Covenant. I don't know if you remember that. We had him as a pride party. He came in in a wheelchair. Couldn't talk or anything, but he was there. We were just glad to have him. I tell you what, thank you, God knows. God wasn't through with Ross. He had a plan for Ross. Ross is a little different today. Was he perfect before? No, because I mentioned his name came to spank him a lot when he was little. He was not perfect. But I tell you what, it's like the story in the Bible when God healed the, the man blind from birth, his disciples said, who, who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus said, neither one. He's, he was blind for the glory of God because the glory of God was, was in him when, when Jesus healed him. You see in the glory of God right here in this little young man. When you see him every service at church here, you see in the glory of God. God getting glory out of Ross's life because he's still here. That's thanks to be a human mind. He wanted to sing this song, so I'm going to let him sing it. I'm going to sing a little bit with him, but I'm going to try for nobody to hear me. I want everybody to hear him because he can sing. So, Ross, you ready to sing? Stand up there and sing. He gets, he's, he's been wanting to do this forever, so he's going to sing. God, the wonder of his hands. And Ross is the wonder of his hands. 